Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to this week's gun store vlog. Today, the question of the week is going to revolve around surplus firearms and why do we see them increasing in price so much? Again, if you're new to the vlogs, I do start off with some things that are going on in the store and then we get into the question of the week. If you are only here for the question of the week, just going down to the comment section, I will have pinned the timestamp for the start of the question of the week down in the comment section so you can bypass all the inventory stuff if you don't care about it. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, so to go along with the theme of surplus firearms, I just got in a really cool shipment of Swiss 9611 and 1911 straight pull rifles chambered in 7.5 by 55 millimeter Swiss. Uh, these are, have gotten increasingly more valuable and a little bit more difficult to find, uh, but I did source a very large number of them, which I'm very happy about, and they are all in generally very good condition. None of them have cracked stocks. From what I could tell, they are all numbers matching. I did a little bit of research and especially on, these are the converted 9611s. You can tell with kind of the grafted on pistol grip and the difference in the curvature of the buttstock. Uh, and I, gosh, there was one other feature they changed. I can't really recall off the top of my head, but I'll remember here in a minute. Sorry about that, I just got a phone call in the middle of filming, but that's what happens. So anyway, one of the cool things I learned is that these actually went out to private firms and were sold independently uh, by like private gun stores and stuff in Switzerland, if I'm remembering this correctly. And a lot of them put their firm or their gun store markings on the firearm um, sort of as a, to kind of, I guess, personalize or show that the inventory came from that gun store. So a lot of these have markings like that. Um, some of them have, see if I can show you. See if that'll focus. Oh, there it goes. Right there it says, um, after Olin, I think that's somebody's name. I don't really know too much about the intricacies of these. But anyway, pretty much all matching, no crack stocks. Some have like very, very minor surface corrosion, pretty good bores on all of them. So just happy to get these in. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the question of the week. Surplus, why has it gone up in price so high over the past couple decades? Well, I think there's several explanations for that. So let's jump back in time to the point where surplus was really starting to hit the market in big numbers, kind of in the late 80s and 90s. Um, and I know surplus have been coming in way before that, but just for purposes of, of this video, we'll start in the, let's start the early to late 90s. So tons of surplus stuff was coming in. You all would remember SKSs, uh, Mosin Nagats, uh, Astra pistols, I mean Makarovs, Tokarevs, all that sorts of stuff. And it was dirt cheap. No, not only at the time was the gun market then not what it is today in terms of the number of people involved in it. You didn't have internet sales and anything like that. Um, you could get SKSs for 60 or 70 bucks. Mose and the Gaunts, even up until the uh, early 20 teens, were like $89. Makarov, 60, 70 bucks. Uh, Astra A100s, you know, 100 bucks or maybe even a little bit less. It was, it was kind of regarded as dime a dozen type stuff. And it was usually the type of stuff that people kind of passed over a lot at the gun shows. And you would usually find literally bins of them stuck in bins and it you know have a tag one for 80 bucks or two for 120 bucks or something like that now the days of that have definitely surpassed us keep in mind from the 80s to the 90s we were not that far away from kind of the cold war era and before and right there into the Cold War era, we passed from the old wood and steel guns with the 10 round fixed magazines, um, sort of into the things like the FALs and the uh, G3 variants, HK91s and things like that, or the, you know, obviously the military G3s. Set me Ls, you know, Spain went to, the United States went to the uh, M14 and M16 during the Cold War era. So the stuff that we could import and the stuff that was inexpensive and the stuff that wasn't produced in machine gun configuration. That was all produced sort of in the 50s and 60s. So you had SKSs, you still had all the Marriott of bolt guns and all this stuff that we could actually as civilians without doing a form four for a machine gun or anything like that, we could own them and still can own them today. So the production of that stuff obviously stopped right at the transition into the new line of the guns that were popular in the 80s and in the late 70s. Um, 
so the supply was what it was and it's been coming in that supply has been coming into the consumer market the 80s the 90s the 2000s the 20 teens up until the, today so the supply of everything that existed overseas has been pretty much wiped out it's been pretty much deplenished and now what we're seeing coming in from the importers is much smaller quantities of that stuff not coming in in huge crates anymore now there are still a bunch of things that exist overseas that we do see pop up at a relatively cheap price like the star bms came in which were affordable uh the 92 s's um rifle wise i mean the the swiss k rifles or the straight pull rifles you know we're still kind of coming in a little bit but even that stuff's getting far you know more far and few between and as we move into the future the old you know stuff that you know future generations are going to look at as old antiquated rifles they were all things that were produced as machine guns so these militaries didn't make semi-automatic G3s. We didn't make semi-automatic M16s. They didn't make semi-automatic AK-47s. So anything that has that we can own would have to be a semi-automatic uh, variation of that. So today what we see of that type of stuff is parts kits guns that are built into semi-automatic configuration. We see that with AKs, the Set Me L, um, which I keep bringing up. Uh, by the way, go watch the video on that when it's up, probably in a couple weeks at Small Arms Solutions. Um, so moving forward, we're not going to have that type of thing. Well, there's also the collectability of it. So in the 80s and 90s the stuff was really not seen as that old and that collectible but today it is and especially anything becomes more collectible when it becomes less common so you have more of that collector's mystique to it they aren't really as a they're not so much a um a viable option compared to modern things that you can get for example a semi-automatic sks and I know some people will argue with this, is not as viable as like a semi-automatic AK-47 or an AR or an AKM, you know, that sort of thing. So you are relegated to the people who want to get them as kind of nostalgic pieces or collector's pieces, not so much for the utilitarian purpose. And when you have a collector's market, collector's markets usually tend to bring a little bit more money. Uh, you have a lot, a lot of people sort of nitpicking the rarities of it. You have a lot more information on what's uncommon and what isn't, which drives more mystique to the items. You have things like gun boards, uh, AR15.com, uh, AK files, where people can really share with each other the rare and obscure things, where people can really get expert information overnight, as opposed to back in the 90s early 90s and late 80s where you didn't have that much uh, resource of information on different things uh, where people have written books on the SKS and the AK and the Mosin Nagant and the uh, Enfields and everything like that. So along with that in the new age of internet you have things like YouTube where people sort of showcase these items. You have video games, you have movies where these things are showcased and that's creating again sort of this era, this aura of mystique and interest especially in newer generations which are now trying to buy them and with the uh, with the unavailability of them you have a larger consumer base so with that you have very low supply and you have growing demand the gun markets in general more and more people are getting into firearms uh, more now than ever and uh, again we have a lot of things to thank for that we have you know all the media and entertainment plus we have politics you know firearms has been a top front and center issue for about the past eight or nine years politically so because of that you have a bunch of people swarming to firearms because they might be afraid that they're going to be banned or certain things are going to be limited uh, for example through importation bans like the 1989 ban on the the chinese stuff and now the, the ban on russian imports so people are now trying to get this stuff very quickly as well before they're banned from future import and a lot of this stuff already is banned from from future import also with all of that it's become very much a seller's market so when you want to go find surplus firearms the days of going to the gun show and seeing tables and tables of guns lined up um, or the days of going to an importer and buying things by the truckload are for the most part behind us okay again some things are still coming in uh, but as time goes on those things are going to be coming in less and less frequently until they're all gone um, and again we're seeing that now so when you do want a surplus firearm you're usually at the mercy of the people the private owners who have them usually you have to search them out 
one at a time through each person that has them. Like for example, when we get a lot of the old surplus stuff, like SKSs for example, uh, or now like Makarovs, we are sort of limited to what people bring in and we and we see things come in one at a time. So an SKS is a great example. Maybe about three years ago was the last time I was able to buy SKSs like wholesale and even then it was like six or seven at a time. Um, now if I get one SKS, it's because one person brought it in, I had to negotiate that price on them. And of course, because I know availability is limited and the market is a little bit higher, the price on it's gonna be a little bit higher than it would have been if I had ordered in 30 of them that I have to get rid of. So, because I know there's gonna be a lot of people wanting that one SKS. Again, supply and demand really comes into it pretty heavily when you're talking about surplus firearms. And sort of the other facet with surplus is it's always something different. People really like the, the sort of the, um, the fact that it's not your run of the mill AR or AKM or Glock that you see, you know, newly produced and on shelves today. Uh, it's something that, you know, you can go out and have a little bit of a different type of entertainment with like, you know, uh, infields are a lot of fun to go out and shoot. It's, uh, there are so many different variants of them that you can collect and put together. And so just, just there's sort of this plethora of reasons that the surplus market is not what it used to be. And it's funny, I've put up videos of surplus firearms, like the top five to buy in 2019 or the top, uh, I think I did like top surplus handguns to buy out before they're dried up or anything like that. And you get so many people in the comment section that are like, why would you pay 400 bucks for an SKS when for that same amount of money, you can build yourself an entry level AR-15? Again, the mindsets are different. You're not looking for something that's necessarily utilitarian. It's the huge amount of people that are looking for stuff that's collectible and also the investment aspect. So we know like SKSs is a great example. We know that the supply that exists of the SKS is what there is and it's not going to, there's not going to be any more unless for some reason a foreign country or a sort of a modern manufacturer decides to make them. Uh, so, you know, you know that if you have, if you go out and buy three or four SKSs or 9130s or Makarovs, for example, and you sit on them for 20, 30 years, you know that the value of them is gonna be significantly higher in the future than it is today. Whereas if you get an off the shelf, maybe an M&P 15 Sport, the value might be higher with inflation if, if you go 20 years down the road, especially if like Smith & Wesson goes out of business or AR-15s are banned and they become like a pre-banned gun. Like you see, and that's a whole other vein, you know, pre-banned firearms and the collectability of those, pre-1994 ban. Um, so, you know, because of that, there's this understanding that people want to get on them now before they go up in value even more. And in a year, people will be thinking the same thing when the value is higher than it is today. So uh, just some interesting things. And again, we could even talk about uh, sort of the, that would be an interesting sort of topic is also the investor perspective on firearms also. Uh, again, with manufacturers making things today, if you actually look at the time or the quality that goes into an SKS or a K31, or even a Mosin Nagant. To do that exact you know, machining, everything was machined, uh, and, and that sort of precision that goes into it, the modern manufacturers would have to charge even more than the surplus guns go for today. Like, if Ruger made an SKS, they would probably, in that same quality, the machined receiver and everything, you take like uh, the PC carbine, which is five or $600, okay, the manufacturing of that's a lot easier than would be the manufacturing on a K31. So if those manufacturers were even to make them today, they would still be significantly more expensive for us to buy than the surplus stuff that exists today. But there will be a point in time where those two intersect where the cost to manufacture today becomes less than what people are willing to pay for the surplus stuff. And at that point in time, I predict that manufacturers will start creating retro lines of those things, uh, especially if the manufacturers exist today that were the same manufacturers or arsenals that made the old stuff. And we're already starting to see retro stuff more popular. Like Mossberg just came out with a retro line of their old shotguns. Colt came out with a retro line. Smith & Wesson's now making the retro uh, classic revolver series. So it's sort of that mindset that I think will permeate even into the future with the new market. But until then, we still uh, will see the prices of surplus firearms escalate. 
Anyway, I'm gonna leave you guys with that. Let me know your thoughts about this down in the comment section if you agree or disagree or have any, any other thoughts of your own. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. And if you wanna see more videos like this, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for future notifications. Thanks again, guys. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.